Thank you, and thanks for keeping the energy level just as high as it was this morning. It's fantastic to see all of you so engaged here. Just one more quick comment, if I may, on Sarah Beckman, because Sarah Beckman is an anchor in a lot of the programming that we have here. She is the reason, for example, that Business Week named us recently as one of the world's top design-oriented business schools. So that's a program she really built out, and I thank her for that. Our keynote here is Kathy Leschik, as you know. Kathy is Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of HP, Hewlett Packard, where she is responsible for the company's overall financial activities and leads several departments, including business units, finance, treasury, tax, and also controllership. A 23-year veteran of HP, previously she was Senior Vice President and Treasurer responsible for managing the company's worldwide cash, debt, foreign exchange, capital structure, risk management, and benefits plan administration. She also managed financial operations for two units, the Enterprise Marketing and Solutions Unit and also the Software Global Business Unit. Before that, she served as Controller and Credit Manager for the group called Commercial Customer Organization and also managed HP's global channel credit risk. Leschik has a bachelor's degree in biology from Stanford University and her MBA from Haas. Kathy, thank you for being here. So, so it dawns on me as I listen to Rich read your rich history in the finance uh, industry that you should be sitting in this chair interviewing her. And I, how the designer ended up here, I don't know. But that's so a, When I that's listen a, to it, it sounds like I'm just really old. <laughs> so, it, 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 time goes by, doesn't it? Does. It? Uh, it turns out we started at Hewlett Packard roughly the same time. She's lasted there much better than I happened to last there. So, so, so I want to start. Um, I, when I read your bio, I thought, biology? So how did you first come to be interested in biology, and then how did biology transform into? You, you know, I actually started, uh, when I graduated from high school, I thought that, uh, in fact, I thought I desperately wanted to be a doctor. And so um, when I got to college, I obviously t did pre-med. And I, uh, I was in the middle of my junior year, and I was, I was kind of standing there thinking, wow. I have so much more schooling to do if I want to be a doctor. And, um, and I was doing OK in my classes, but I wasn't doing great. And, and I really kind of dug deep, and I said to myself, is this really what I want to do? Is this playing to my strengths? And if, if I really wanted to do it badly enough, um, even though it was really difficult for me, I would do it. But I stepped back, and I, uh, at that time, I had been working actually in a bank in the summer. Um, as a teller, so nothing pretty, very exciting, um, just to, to make money, but got a sense of what it was like to be in banking. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm actually better in, in econ, I'm better in more business-oriented classes. And so in the middle of the junior year, I had maybe a couple more um, bio classes to finish the degree, and so I finished the degree, and at the same time started taking as many econ um, and business-oriented courses as Stanford has. I don't know if you understand, but Stanford doesn't have an undergraduate business school, so there was no real opportunity to go out and get a business degree at an undergraduate level. And so I, I realized that I actually had more of a passion um, around business and econ. It came easier, and, it, and I just I have always found that when you really love what you're doing um, and you're good at it, you'll put 110% into it. Um, and so that was the, probably the first career um, course correction that I made um, in the middle of my junior year. And, and did you um, ever work in biology at all then? Or? I didn't. And I mean, I slaved in labs and I slaved in classes, but I never, uh, I never did anything um, you know, to earn a living um, with the biology degree at all. Um, it really was a decision midway through that said, this isn't really the right thing for me. So tell us how you got from um, graduating with a degree in biology to Hewlett Packard and the finance area. So after I graduated from uh, Stanford, I immediately went to work for a bank. Um, and actually, I worked for a bank in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, Texas American Bank Shares. And I was a, a credit analyst there. Um, I joined that, and I had never, I'd never lived in Texas before, so it was a little bit of a culture shock. 
Um, I had moved around a lot as a child. Uh, my dad worked for Procter & Gamble and we moved every year and a half or two. And so I remember when I took the job at um, for, uh, Texas American Bank Shares, people said, well, why are you moving to Texas? Do you have family there? Do you have friends there? I'm like, no, I don't know anybody. <laughs> and they're like, wow. And I was like, this is no big deal. I've moved around a lot. I know how to kind of make friends. I know how to, to kind of make things work. Um, and, and so I did that for a year. And then um, my now husband, fiance at the time, um, was deciding between um, graduate school on the West Coast and graduate school on the East Coast. And so he arrived, uh, we decided that I would move wherever he was gonna go. So he arrived in June in Fort Worth, Texas, and he still had not told me which direction we were driving. <laughs> but he ultimately did decide, and we uh, drove east. And so then I worked for a bank for a couple of years in, in Boston. And in that job, I was basically a commercial lender, and I loved the analytics of lending, and I hated the cold calling related to lending. And so again, another point in my career, I'm like, okay, what am I really good at? I'm not good at cold calling and hard cold, cold uh, sales. I'm really much better at analytics. And so then at that point, I'm like, okay, well, it, where do I want to go next? I really need an MBA. Um, and so at that point, my husband was just graduating with his MBA, and he was debating again whether or not he had a job offer on the West Coast, and he had a job <laughs> on, uh, offer on the East Coast. I got in and, on, in a, uh, a program on both coasts, and, and it was my choice this time. And uh, we basically came west, and obviously I went to, to Berkeley Graduate School, graduated from Berkeley Graduate School, actually took a job um, with Safeway in their marketing analytics group, um, graduating from Berkeley. In fact, in March of my year, I turned down four or five other offers and took the Sa Safeway offer. It was supposed to start August 1st on July 28th. Um, you guys are a lot younger, I'm sure, than I am, so you probably don't remember, but in that summer of 1986, um, Safeway um, was essentially green-mailed green into going private. And so on July 26th, they called me and they said, you really don't want to work for a company that's going private. This is going to be you know, a really tough environment. You're not going to like it. And I said, no, it sounds great to me. It sounds like a fabulous challenge. It's going to be where you're going to need a lot of help. And they go, no, 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 you're really not going to like it. And I said, no, I really think I am going to like it. And they said, oh, OK, in that case, we're laying you off. <laughs> so um, before I even started, I'd been laid off. Um, I was living in uh, San Francisco at the time, and I looked around the Bay Area, um, trying kind of Oakland, San Francisco for a job. Um, took a couple of months, didn't find anything, and so you guys are going to really laugh at this one. I said to my husband, I'm going to have to apply to Hewlett Packard. It's, it's the biggest company in the area. I, I, I know I don't want to work for a high tech company, but you know, this, I, I got to do it, I got to get a job. And so I applied in the Treasury Department, and uh, you know, I thought I'd stay for a couple of years. And I'd learn as much as I could, and two years turned into five, and then five turned into 10, and now it's almost 24 years. And uh, that's how I got here. So what about that high tech thing? I stayed, so if you, if you think about a, a company and you think about Treasury, you can stay in the Treasury Department of a company and never understand the company, ever. <laughs> you don't need to understand what they sell. You don't really understand how they sell it. You need to know kind of what the exposures get generated, what foreign exchange flows, because if it's a global company, you need to understand interest rates. You need to know what kind of cash it generates. But at the end of the day, you don't need to know what a server is, from what the software is, from what a PC is, or a printer. And so I stayed there for 12 years, <coughs> thinking that I can never get out of here um, because I don't understand all that stuff. And I was just wrong. You know, I, I, uh, the first job I took out, I was actually the um, controller over our commercial channels organization. So this was the organization that basically did distribution and logistics and selling for all PCs and all printers. And again, I thought, okay, PCs and printers. I can understand PCs and printers. Um, and, and so I learned the business there. And then, at coming at, then I was reorged out of a job and didn't know. I was a kind of at a crossroads in my career. I'd been at HP at that point almost 14 years and was debating about, do I stay at HP? Do I go someplace else? Because I was basically going to get a severance package um, if I didn't find something in the next kind of short while. And, um, and I looked externally. And I thought seriously about leaving HP. And in the end, I didn't. 
And one of the biggest reasons I didn't um, was because HP offered a flexible work schedule in a way that I, I had small kids at the time and it was a really big deal for me to be able to work from home when I needed to work from home. And it was right at the, that point in time when you had notebooks and you had mobility and connectivity at home. Um, much before that, there wasn't a lot of connectivity at home, although HP always allowed you to work odd hours. Um, you could work then, you know, at home. I would go to work in the morning, you know, if my child had some, a doctor's appointment or something in kindergarten that they wanted, you know, I wanted to go participate in, I'd come home and then I'd just, I'd go to the, uh, the event, I'd then come home and I'd work um, from home in the evening. That was a huge, mm -hmm. huge important thing to me and I just, at that point in my career, it wasn't that common for other companies to do that and I was really nervous. I actually gotten a job offer from BEA and I just wasn't convinced that they'd let me do it in the same way. At the same time, uh, an opportunity came up with HP to go work in the software organization and again, her, a huge learning curve for me to go into the software organization because I not only had to, to learn how to manage a P&L, but I also had to understand tech. You really started to had, have to understand tech. And since then, I've obviously learned. I have learned a ton about our business. Um, I, I'm not a real techie at all, but I also realized that there's a lot you can do without being really technical. Mm. Um, that there's, there's a series of skills that you develop, whether they're analytical skills, interpersonal skills, leadership skills, that really have nothing to do with specific um, knowledge and expertise about a particular technology or a particular area. So when you had to learn about tech, how did you go about doing it? Or when you need to rely on technical knowledge to make a decision, what do you do? I ask a lot of questions. And, and I, find, I usually find someone or a group of people who are not going to be too judgmental about how stupid my questions are. Um, or so surprised that, wow, she still doesn't know this. But, but I, I find someone safe, and it's usually two or three people who I can count on that I go to, and I, and I just start at the, the lowest level and, and, and ask a lot of questions. And then I go back and I work a bit, and, and something will happen in the course of a day or the course of a reading that, that isn't consistent with what I thought I understood. So I then go back to them and say, <coughs> excuse me, I'll go back to them and say, okay, I thought it was this way, you know, I thought it was this straight line, and all of a sudden this is going, it's breaking. Why is, what, what did I misunderstand? And that gives me then, it kind of peels back the onion. It keeps giving you a deeper and deeper layer of understanding. I'm a, a learner who learns broad and shallow first and depth later. Other people learn, can't move, they can't, can't go that way. They have to go deep first, but that's not the kind of learner I am. I'm, I'm definitely a, a broad and shallow. And it served me well because I actually can talk the talk pretty quickly um, as long as people don't go too deep. Um, I'm okay. Um, but, but then as they do, I learn and I, and I keep asking more questions and keep peeling back the onion and, and learning what I need to learn. So what have been some of the more difficult times you've had at HP or the challenges you've had in your career? I would say the... The biggest challenges I've had really came from some advice I asked of the CFO at that time at HP, Bob Wayman. I had been in Treasury 12 years and I loved, I loved it. I felt I was being challenged incredibly. Um, I really, what I really wanted to be at that point in time was the treasurer. Um, because I had spent so much time in Treasury and I had enjoyed it so much and I felt like I had really deep knowledge and expertise in that area. And so I went to the CFO and I basically said, I want to be the treasurer. What do I have to be, do to be the treasurer? And my dearest hope was that he was going to say, just stay where you are. You'll keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. You know, this is what it's going to take to be the treasurer. That's not what he said. <laughs> um, he said, no, you're going to have to get broader experiences, Kathy. Um, we, know that you're, we know that you're great in treasury, but we really want a treasurer who is more than just a treasurer. We want the treasurer to be broader. And so I very reluctantly, um, and I was very disappointed with the feedback, but I had asked and I felt like I had to take it. So I went and I interviewed at a variety of different places within HP to get kind of the next broadening rule. And um, it was the single best piece of advice I'd ever gotten. It is, com I'll, when, when I give you kind of my thoughts on career advice, you'll hear why it's, it plays an incredibly important part in what I recommend to people. But the, the hardest experience was kind of getting out of this comfort zone of mine 
um, knowing that I'd performed very well over 12 years in this, in this comfort zone and that I was going to be sh faced with knowing nothing. I mean, I'm someone who likes to have a little bit of control. Um, <laughs> if, if you ask me the kind Unlike of... Unlike most CFOs. Uh, um, <laughs> but, but it really, it, I, it's, it's, a, it's a learning process to learn about yourself. When I first had uh, my, my uh, first child and I took six weeks leave, um, and the first three weeks I kept trying to tell her what we were, how we were going to do it. And she kept, in her own way, telling me that was not the way we were going to do it. And then I, one day I remember saying, let's just let her do, we'll do whatever she wants to do. I mean, this is a, this is a three-week-old, so she wasn't doing a lot. <laughs> but I just, I just let it, kind of let it be yeah. on her schedule. And my husband came home that day and said, how was your day? I said, it was fabulous. And he said, why? And I said, because I got nothing done, but... Sarah was incredibly happy. <laughs> anyway, so I like, I like to have that control. So what was happening to me in these, I'd go into these meetings and, and, and the jargon, and the jargon that probably at any company is, is significant and all the acronyms, um, but at, in Treasury I knew all of them. So I get thrown into these meetings and, and whole meetings were going by and I was in a, my head was spinning. I was like, I don't understand anything. And again, I'd, I'd madly take all these notes, and then I'd go back to my desk, I'd pull my staff in and say, okay, they said the following things, what did it mean? And I'd, you know, it kind of, that was how I had to learn. Um, but it was scary. It was really scary. I was very uncomfortable. What was the first job that you took after you the, got that The advice? commercial channels organization. So that was the one, okay. So it, it really was, you had to understand everything about printers, PCs, you had to understand about distribution, logistics, credit terms. Um, so there was a lot to learn, and the jargon, like I said, was pretty incredible. Um, and so I was frightened. I, I was frightened almost every day for the longest time. And then slowly but surely, meetings started to get better. You know, it, it, when I was missing 80% at the beginning, you know, I then started to learn I only missed 60% and then 40%. And it just, you kept building on your, your level of comfort and your level of understanding. And then a year and a half later, I got reorged out of that job. And, just and, when you'd figured out what it all meant. And I don't think so I was all the way up the learning curve, but I was getting a lot got more comfortable. Um, but the key then was the next job was not nearly as scary. Mm. It wasn't as scary because I proved to myself that I could do more than one thing. In Treasury, coming out of Treasury, I knew I was good on Treasury. I, I, but I, going out of Treasury, I had to prove to myself, but I also had to prove to the company. And that's really important is that you, you're kind of proving to the company and to yourself and developing that confidence that, that I wasn't a run trick pony, that I had skills, that I didn't have all the knowledge of the business, but I had skills that I could pick up and move to various um, areas of the company and that I would have a steep learning curve, but I was also good at learning. And so that next job, while an, another really big step because the commercial channels organization for those of you that are in, in uh, corporations, it was a cost center job. And a cost center job, the mentality is very different. The mentality in the cost center job is get as big a budget as you possibly can. And then figure out what you're going to do with it. But the, the goal for the controller was, for my GM, was to get the biggest budget we could get. Um, when you move to a P&L, life's a lot more hot, difficult. Um, because you've got to make sure that you drive profit in that organization. And so it's, it's a, it's a multi-dimensional problem as opposed to a single dimensional problem. Um, but I, but I, it was a lot more comfortable. Again, steep learning curve, lots to learn, lots of mistakes I made, um, lots of learning, but had developed the confidence that I could learn it. And I did uh, that for, I think it was about three years. And then the, the treasurer's job finally came open and I interviewed for that. And when I left Treasury, I left with the, the goal of becoming the treasurer. And I felt at that time that if I didn't get to the treasurer at HP, um, I was going to leave HP because I wanted to be the tre a treasurer. And five years later, having proven to myself that I could do a variety of things, found a number of things that I really liked to do as much as I like to do Treasury, and that I was good at it, five years later, I interviewed. Would I have been disappointed if I hadn't got the job? Uh, sure. Would I have left the company? Not a chance. There were just so many, the world had opened up to me so many other opportunities that I could have been happy in a lot of different things. And that was a, a really big learning, personal learning of mine, is that there's a lot of different things that you can do and enjoy doing and do well. Um, so those are kind of my, my big events and my big learnings.
So um, one of the things Richard didn't mention, because it's actually not in your bio, is the number of hits when you were Googled that show you on various lists of the most powerful women in the, um, in the world. Uh, so the transition to CFO, could you use the same learning skills? And, and what are the big challenges facing you in, in this position? I will, I will tell you that the step up to CFO has been the steepest learning curve. The, it, was, um, it, was, is, it was and it continues to be at times um, very uncomfortable. Um, and I can tell you, um, or my husband probably can tell you, that the first, first, the first full year for sure, although I think it's continued, um, and I've been in the job three years now, um, I didn't smile a lot because I was scared all the time. You know, I was learning. I mean, HP is a huge company. It's in, it's got like seven different, fundamentally different business models and, and different way, you know, different businesses. And, and the CFO needs to be broad, but they also need to be able to go deep enough so that you can answer all the questions that your investors are asking you. And, um, and it's also a very broad job in terms of people, the investors feel like they can ask you anything about the macroeconomic environment, anything about your, your um, investors, and so you've, you've got to get good at, at, at times answering questions with a non-answer because you really don't want to answer that question, and at other times kind of dance around it a bit because you don't really know what the answer is, um, but sound intelligent. Um, so it's, it's, been, it's been a huge, huge learning curve. The other big thing was the Treasury Department was about 100 people. And to lead an organization of 100 people is, is very different than to lead an organization, a finance organization of 7,000 people. The, the Treasury organization... And I, I think the bigger context, is to, it, there's 321,000 people at, at Packard in general. Yes. So to be the financial leader of... It's a, very, size, it, it's, a huge, it's a very it's a very yeah. public job for sure, yeah. both both across the three hundred and twenty thousand, but also investors and right. and you know press and stuff like that. And I, um, so that's that's a struggle in and of itself. But actually leading a seven thousand person organization, when you're if it's a hundred people, you can pretty much put your arms around every one of them, and you can talk to them, and you know who they are, and you you in general you know kind of what's important to them. And so you know how to talk to the, to the organization. 7,000 people, you can't do it that way. You've got to rely on the, the management um, layers in the organization to deliver your message. And, and, and you guys have all played the game of telephone. And, and you know, the first person got it, sort of. And they got 90% of it. And then they shared it to the next person. And they got 90% of the 90%. And it keeps degrading the message. And I get this all the time. And that's one of the big, for, for the leader of the finance organization, that's also a, a huge learning, is uh, how do you kind of get your philosophy, the way you want people to think about problems, the way you want to develop leaders within your organization, kind of get that through all these different layers. We have something like seven layers of management. It doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're down at the, at the lower level, you're talking about uh, you know a thousand, a thousand different managers, and you're not able to connect with them in the same way. Yeah. So in the time you've been at HP, there have been many, many different, well, many yeah. different Lots of CEOs, yeah. right? Um, and and how how have you accommodated yourself to different ways of thinking that are represented by those different um, people? So without, without judgment on any of them, I'm yeah. just interested, you've had to sort of shift. Uh, so I've really only had to, to shift for t or, or deal with two. Mm -hmm. Because um, kind of at the, uh, underneath the treasurer level, it was low enough in the organization that I wasn't interacting on a, on a real, per on a day-to-day -day or a face-to-face -face basis with um, the CEOs. Um, and so I was feeling the impact of the CFO or the CEO philosophy and culture on a, on a diluted basis. Um, and one of the things that I found with HP, and, and, I, and I think it's true of anybody, when, when you go to a company, you really want to pick the, a company that has a culture that fits you really well. And HP's culture has always been very analytic. Um, and, and that's always played to my strength. Um, I would say that Carly Fiorina wasn't as analytical um, she was much more marketing, much more out there, um, creating buzz 
around HP, kind of creating the vision for HP. Um, Mark Hurd is very analytical, very numbers oriented, so I haven't really had to adjust that much to his style because he is not that different in the way he thinks about um, solving problems than I am. Although he's got a phenomenal memory, and boy, I wish I could have the same memory he had. <laughs> he's incredibly smart, and it's a, it's a great opportunity to learn. Um, with Carly, what I did was I tried to put some more analytical structure around the things that I was taking to her. Um, and the other thing I did under Carly, because she was so customer-oriented, um, that I started being the account sponsor for, or exec sponsor for a lot of different financial institutions from a customer perspective. And so she got to know me mostly on the customer side. Hmm. And, and while I'm not great at pure selling, I'm, it turns out I'm pretty good with relationships. And so um, that's another, another area where, where she and I were you know, connected pretty well, and, and that obviously helped my career quite a bit. And challenges today? Still coming up that learning curve. Three years into the job, there's no shortage of opportunity to learn. New things are coming up all the time. Um, and, and basically developing, I guess the, the biggest challenge I still, I don't think I've really conquered or gotten comfortable with is press. I'm not sure I love media that much. Um, but learning how to Stop deal. Stop the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning how to, how, to, how to deal with the media. I've had a lot of media training now um, to, to really um, do a lot more press. So starting, I guess it's three quarters ago now, um, I do um, a lot of the press around our earnings call, whereas prior to that, um, her did all the press. And so now we're, I'm, I'm doing the bulk of the press, um, and, uh, and that's still lots of opportunity to learn. But, I, but to me, that's what makes jobs fun, to be honest with you. It's what's kept me at HP. Um, I love the people at HP, but what's really important to me is challenging, interesting work. Regardless of what the level is, I've always wanted to do challenging, interesting work, and, and HP's just open to new ideas, um, leaders who want to take um, organizations in a different direction, um, and, and basically to create value. And so HP gives me all those opportunities, and that's what keeps me at HP. So um, I'm going to ask a few more questions, but I'll invite those of you, we're going to open it up to you. So if you've got questions you want to ask, I invite you to move yourselves to the microphone, because that'll take you a few minutes to make that happen. But um, you've talked about your family, your husband in particular, and, and your various different decisions. How does this work-life uh, balance thing work for you? And uh... So it doesn't work that well when you're in a lear really steep learning curve, so it's starting to get better. Um, but I have, uh, I have uh, basically husband, two daughters. My older daughter is a freshman in college. And my younger daughter is a junior in high school. So the fact that they're older helps a lot. In fact, before I took the CFO job, we had a, we had a, a family meeting. And, and I basically talked about what, it, what I thought it was going to be like and wanted to make sure that um, my husband and my kids were on board. Because it, it really is, I'm, I'm, I travel 35% of the time. Even when I'm here, next week it's um, our shareholder meeting and our board meeting, and I'm either, at, I'm either working late those nights or at dinners most of next week. I was gone in New York all last week, the week before I was in South America, so I'm not around as much as I used to be. And we're grateful you've given up Saturday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> well, my, my daughter just took, thank you. <laughs> My, my daughter took the SATs this morning, and she said all she wanted to do was be a vegetable this afternoon, so it was good timing. Um, but, but I think that when we sat down and I said, said this is what it's going to be like, do you, think we, do you think we ought to do this? It wasn't do you think I ought to do it, it was do you think we ought to do it, because it's going to be, have an impact on all of us. And um, my kids were old enough, obviously, if they were younger, I wouldn't have had that kind of a discussion with them, but they were, they were fabulous. They basically said, listen, this is a tremendous opportunity for you, Mom. We're really proud of you. We know you can do it. You know, we're, we'll support you. And that's, that, having that buy-in up front has really helped when the frustrations come, because they do come. I mean, there are times when I'm not there, especially when my younger one wants me to be there. And, and I know early on, I could tell she was biting her tongue. She just didn't want to get mad at me. And I said, you know, Kate, just get mad. You know, it's bad. I'm sorry I'm not here. But I'm with you. I, I, I should be here, and it's okay to be mad at me. And she says, but I agreed you should take this job. I'm like, it doesn't matter. 
you still can be upset and we can talk about it. But it's really been important that we, were, we made the decision together um, to get that buy-in, to get that willingness to make trade-offs. Um, and then my husband, a year actually before I got offered this job, um, he had retired to stay at home and his plan was just to stay at home a couple of years and, and he's still staying at home. Um, you can kind of get used to it, I hear. Yeah, <laughs> so. It's pretty nice. It's definitely nice. So, so just in closing, your career advice for women in this room. Yep. You've, you've given us a few of your thoughts. but yeah. So I think, I think the key thing is finding a job you really like um, and finding a great manager. And at least, and I tell this to people at HP, um, so it's no, no different. There are good managers and there are bad managers, and you want to find the best manager you can. Because managers will help you develop, they'll coach you on your next moves, they'll push you out of the nest when you need to be pushed out of the nest. Bad managers won't do a lot of those things, but most importantly, they won't push you out. Because what they want is they want to keep you because you're doing such a fantastic job for them. And they never want to go through that, that, that situation where they've got to train somebody else. Um, and so I think those are really important things. I think getting broad opportunities, testing yourself in lots of different environments, taking the skills that you've developed and putting them in different situations is um, the best way to learn and develop. Um, when I was in Treasury, one of the key learnings was that I thought I was learning a lot. I thought I was challenged. Turns out I was probably only learning 20 or 30 percent of the time. When I moved to the, then each time I've changed jobs, I realized you can learn 80 or 90 percent of the time. And that real development, fast development, happens when you do things like that. And then the, the final thing is when you take on um, a new opportunity, don't, don't jump off the ledge. Pick that opportunity that stretches you and develops you, but one in which you've got the core things to be successful in it. Because one of the other things you really need to do is you need to prove your credibility fast. You need to find that area where you're strong and bring it to that new job because, frankly, you'll make mistakes. You'll make at least if you're like me, you'll make embarrassing mistakes. Um, one of the examples I'll give you is that I went from a cost center to a P&L and the software business at the time was losing money. And um, I was used to, um, on a profit line, that if you were over 100% of your plan, it was good news. So, I looked at the plan, the forecast came in, the results said we were going to be over 100% of the bottom line. I went to my boss, I said, great news, we're over plan. This is great. Unfortunately, we were making a loss, and so the loss was bigger than the plan. <laughs> and again, it took me about 15 or 20 minutes of more work to realize that, oh my God, I made this terrible, stupid, stupid mistake, and I had to call him. And I had to tell him that I made this mistake. And I can imagine him driving home thinking, what, who have I hired? <laughs> um, but I had other areas where I'd proven that I, had, I could add value. And so he stuck with me. Um, and I have to be honest with you, he was one of my big supporters when I was applying for the CFO role. He, he wrote me a fabulous reference. At the time, he had left the kid, retired already. So he wrote a reference to Mark Hurd. And, um, and so those are the, the things that I think have made, helped make me successful, and what I see is helpful in making other people successful. Thank you for that. We'll take some questions. Uh, you mentioned making a few mistakes along the line. Can you speak more about how to take those mistakes, live up to them, and turn them into assets, perhaps, that will further your career growth rather than being part of your track record and right. dragging you down? So, so the most important thing about making mistakes is learning from them. I mean, there's just, it's as simple as that, is that you don't, you don't want to make that same mistake again. Um, and you want to, want to, I mean, there were two things, you could look at two things that I made a mistake on. One, I gave the wrong information, obviously. I, I, I misunderstood what I was looking at. But almost as importantly is I was too quick to give the feedback. I should have spent more time really making sure I understood in depth what I was talking about before saying something. And so I just, you just, you got to learn from those mistakes. The other thing that I think is really important, and I spend a lot of time reading about mistakes that other people have made, especially other CFOs, other companies, um, just to see what mistakes they make to, so that I can learn from them without ever having to, to do them myself. Um, and I really believe that that's another thing a really good manager will help you with, is help you, help you learn from the same mistakes that they made. Um, and I, and uh, the, you want from a manager to admit they made mistakes and what they were and, and help you not make those mistakes. Um, because again, we're all human and, and 
Well, we will all make mistakes. We just want to learn from them. Hi. Hi. I'm Sally Thornton. I have a company called Flexperience, and we're very much committed to flexibility in the workplace. And so HP's been a leader. Thank you very much. And it was exciting to hear that even when you were choosing HP, one of the main attractions was that you could figure out how to get the results on your own time. What's HP's current philosophy around flexible work and supporting women in this sort of more fluid way to, to achieving you know, more executive roles? So, so I'll, I'll be flipping first. HP allows you to work the 23 hours a day you have to work any 23 <laughs> hours of the day you want. That may be just me, but um, I, we, we are incredible, incredibly flexible, and the connectivity in, um, that you get these days, um, it kind of, you can work anywhere, any place, any time, um, and, and I think mo a lot of companies are that way. Obviously, I, my experience is with HP, but I think that that is incredibly important. Um, and when people talk to me about work life, it's really important for me to make it work is that they had to be completely intertwined. I know there are a lot of people out there that really want work to stay at work and on life to stay at home. Um, I could never, I just can't make it work. I couldn't from, for a long time because the demands of raising um, little kids were all throughout the day. Um, so I think that's really important. But I do, you want to make sure you find the company that works for you depending on where you are in kind of your, your growing up. Um, for me, HP has been incredibly helpful because I can work anywhere, any place. And HP is actually driving a lot more virtual as well. Um, if you think about um, the 7,000 people at HP that are in the finance organization, they're all over the world, and I've got to deal with a lot of them all over the world at all different times. Um, and some of them work from home, and I never even know, and I don't even care. Um, and I think that's important. And are job, steer job shares still supported? Um, the question is whether or not job shares are supported. Yes, they are. In fact, I've got, um, not directly reporting to me, but d directly reporting to um, one of my direct reports, um, we've got two, two very VP-level um, women who job share. And they do it so well that, that nobody really knows where one begins, one ends and the other one begins. They split the, they basically work kind of Monday, Tuesday, someone works Monday, Tuesday, they both work Wednesday, and then the other person works um, Thursday, Friday, and the, pa the handoffs are incredible. Um, I had a controller when I was in software, I had a pair of controllers, um, so director level individuals who job shared as well. And it, what, what makes it really successful is that seamlessness, so that it's, you never get, hmm, ask that question, you said, oh, well, I thought we already talked about it, and they say, well, you didn't talk about it with me. That, that doesn't happen in really good job shares. Um, it's still, it's very well supported at HP. It's still not common, and it's not common because it's hard. It's hard to find the, the other person to split the work week with you so that, you know, it works well together. Um, I also think if you're thinking about doing it, find someone who compliments you. One of the, the couple I was talking about, we were talking about, we were doing talent management in my staff, and we were talking about, you know, whether individually they were as good as they were as a team. And, and the answer was that they weren't as good individually. And the reason is that one was really strong in um, kind of leadership areas, while the other one was stronger in analytical. And, and their combination actually made them better than individually, which is, I, I thought was pretty interesting. Um, that's not, a, that's not I, when I was pushing around the staff, I was like, are you kidding? Give me a break. But, you know, they said no. They very complement each other very much, and therefore they, the whole is better than the sum of the parts. So. Any other questions? I have a couple more if you don't, but yeah, there. So um, you mentioned hanging out with other CFOs. Um, how, how do you uh, network within and outside HP in order to do your work? I will tell you, I don't do it as much as I should. Um, and it's just because there are only 24 hours. And if I'm going to work 23 of them, I'm going to be pretty busy. Um, but I, I do. I have um, three different peer-to-peer uh, -peer CFO groups. Um, one that's um, nationwide. Two of them are West Coast-based. And, and I try to make as many meetings as I can. They, in total, those three groups meet 10 times in the year. Um, to be frank, I probably only make three or four of them. I'd like to make more because that opportunity to talk with other people who have similar jobs 
um, are in many cases trying to solve similar problems um, is incredibly helpful. Um, those, those, for, those, for me, the best ones are the ones that are larger companies because smaller companies have much different challenges um, than the larger companies. Um, they're, they're, no, they're no easier or, not, or, or harder, they're just different. Um, but, but I get a lot out of that kind of networking. Um, I also found that within HP, networking is very important. And, and I've never had a formal mentor, nor have I ever really had kind of formally gone out and tried to network. It's always a little awkward to call someone up and, and in, it, not even if you, you don't even have to say I'm networking, trying to network with you. It comes through pretty clear if you don't know them very well that they're trying to network with you. Um, but really what it is is there's so many different meetings at HP that the opportunity to kind of connect with the people in the meeting before the meeting or after the meeting to follow up if you have questions, that all is creating networking opportunities. The five years that I spent outside of Treasury, when I, when I went back as a treasurer, um, was incredible. It was amazing to me how many people I'd met. So that now when I had Treasury questions or things that I needed the business to help me do something different in order to optimize Treasury or I needed to understand something, I had a plethora of people to call and ask for help. And it was amazing that in five years you could have developed that, am that amount of uh, connections, and it really comes from making sure that you take advantage of all the different opportunities, informal and formal, um, to do the networking. Are the CFO networking events formally structured, or are these more casual conversations? They're more formally structured. They're, it's, it's typically, they're almost all about a day. Um, one of them ha starts the night before with a dinner, um, and then basically a whole day, and, and it, it's interesting because there's always on the agenda three or four speakers. Um, and many times, at least um, w one of them is external, the rest usually are, are internal to the group, but talking about a particular problem or issue. Um, and then we spend usually uh, an hour, hour and a half to two and a half hours around ra going around the table. Mm. And when we go around the table, it's, everyone's asked to basically, what's, what's kind of on your mind? What question do you want to ask of this group? And the group tends to be anywhere from 10 to 15 people, so it's not a, it's, these are not massive groups, it's not like in an auditorium. Mm -hmm. um, it's really around the table and you basically say, this is the problem I'm, I'm working on, have you dealt with this, any suggestions on how I might deal with it, um, any places you'd send me to get more information, and that is the, that is the benefit of the meeting. It, it's almost not the, the prepared remarks, presentation stuff, it's the uh, going around the table. So last question. Yep. What's your next role? Hopefully you got the sense that I have not scaled this role yet. <laughs> and then I still have plenty of, to learn. And so I'll stay in this role for a while. I don't have any real, I don't have an ambition to be the, a CEO somewhere. Um, I really do believe that, that this is probably in, in a large organization, this is probably the top role I'm gonna have and I'm gonna have it for a while still. And then, and, and after that, when I quote unquote retire, my plan is actually to join a few boards, um, probably two or three different boards, and, um, and basically help other companies um, kind of at the, at the board of directors level. I get a lot of good interaction with the board at HP and, and kind of see how it's done. And so I'm, I'm learning on that side as well. And I'd like to then take those learnings and, and my skills and experiences and put them in in, uh, to help other companies. It's been a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. It's for been coming. great to be here. Thank you, everybody.